Kendra, thank you very much. Tammy, thank you very much for allowing me to be here to speak about the hidden curriculum. It seems as if the world is getting more complex every day. Um, and as a result, our kids are more complex. And when we are teaching or supporting students or even parenting, you know, we're trying to figure out what we are supposed to do, what we are supposed to teach. And in the school system, you know, um, really what we should be doing is when we are teaching our students with autism or indeed any students, we should be making sure that our students have the skills so that they can engage in future education or training when they leave us, that they can live as independently as they possibly can, that they can have a job and that they can have relationships. So our job in the school system is to create life success for our students. Now, this in many ways seems counter to what we are being charged to do in that largely we are being charged to teach academics, but we really need to reflect upon what we should be doing because we have been charged by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act to go beyond academics to ensure that our folks are prepared for life. Now, a lot of what we teach if, when we have a total academic focus quite often doesn't translate into life success. I'd like to share with you um, three questions from state exams and to ask you how these relate to living a high quality of life. 36 times four equals four times nine times two times two is an example of which property. Now, I would bet that most of you, unless you're a math teacher, don't know the answer to this question, but not knowing the answer to this question, has this kept you from having a bank account, writing a check, buying something that you want or need? Probably not. Now, this question is a grade six question on a state exam. What do the Mayan, Incan, and Aztec civilizations have in common? It's interesting to me that a large number of people typically know this, and the answer is large planned cities. But I'd like to ask you, did this help you make a friend? If you knew this answer, did it help you get a job? Is this information useful in the long run? And finally, a family is shopping for a house. They want a house with a big yard in a particular neighborhood. They find an affordable house, but the yard is small. If they buy the house, what will the opportunity cost? Well, the answer that I didn't know until I um, cheated is a big yard. Now, for those of you like me who didn't know the answer, did that prevent you from living in a house, a condo, an apartment, a duplex? The answer is probably not. And so we need to ask ourselves to go back to what IDEA charges us with, to ask ourselves, what should we teach? Our time that we have with our students, our children is limited. And as I said, we often focus on academics. And then also we don't take into account something called the forgetting curve. Now, research shows that when we teach something to someone, that that person is likely to forget at least half of what they have learned unless they actively practice that skill. Now, what happens in our current system? Well, we teach a skill, the child masters it, we move on. Unless we go back and revisit that skill, the child may not have that skill in his repertoire. So not only do we need to teach skills, we need to reteach or at least do quick checks to make sure that our students maintain these skills. Now, is the forgetting curve important? 
I think it is. And I'd like to show you its importance with a brief video clip called the Five Minute University. It features Father Guido Sarducci from Saturday Night Live talking about the information that you have been taught, but you haven't practiced, the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is the set of rules, unwritten rules, that no one is directly taught, but everyone who is neurotypical knows. It is information that is supposedly dropped out of the sky and it's hit neurotypical folks, but it's missed autistic folks. And even though information is not directly taught, it is so important. And if you do not know some of these rules, you can become a social outcast or your health and well being could be threatened. Now, you may not have thought about the hidden curriculum in that sort of terms, but you may have thought some phrases that are related to the hidden curriculum. So for example, if you've thought any of these for a nanosecond, you're thinking about the hidden curriculum. I shouldn't have to tell you, but everyone knows that. I never thought I would have to teach. It's obvious that. Okay. These are all phrases associated with the hidden curriculum, unwritten rules that are necessary to learn. So why do we need to teach the hidden curriculum? Well, it's very interesting, but if you look at the way people interact, the words they say, the meaning behind them, the literal meaning of the words, quite often there's not a match. And I saw this cartoon and it says, look at me, I'm neurotypical. I give weird hints about things instead of just telling people. So this is why we need to teach the hidden curriculum. Neurotypical people often do not say exactly what they mean. The term assumptions and expectations are associated with the term hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum contains many different elements. For example, it contains idioms and metaphors. What does it mean to, lead, to let the cat out of the bag? whoever came up with that in the first place. An autistic person who is literal will think there must be a cat, there must be a bag, and doesn't that make sense? What does it mean to have a skeleton in your closet, that there's an elephant in the room or a bee in your bonnet? Okay. If you would teach one idiom or one metaphor per week to a child who has autism, you will significantly improve their ability to communicate and understand others. The hidden curriculum also includes facts and opinions. Unless otherwise taught, many autistic people think that facts are something that they believe and opinions are things that they don't believe and therefore are wrong. And so teaching what is factual and what is an opinion is extremely helpful and essential in life. Also, the hidden curriculum contains jokes and riddles that use a lot of non-literal language. The hidden curriculum also contains words that have multiple meanings as illustrated here. Look how instinctively the mother croc carries the baby in its mouth. Nature is beautiful. Now the hidden curriculum differs, as I said earlier, across a lot of variables. For example, the hidden curriculum differs across age. The unwritten rules that you know as a six-year-old may not apply when you are 17 or 18. For example, you are a six-year-old boy. 
And how do you express as a six-year-old boy how you like perhaps a six-year-old girl? Okay, now most of you know that you can express this as a six-year-old by hitting, chasing, or pulling hair. Now, most of you were not taught this directly, but you figured it out. And if you are a six-year-old, is this information important? The answer is absolutely. We're all a child who has autism, who needs direct instruction to learn information and has challenges picking up assumptions or expectations. He's out on the playground and a child comes up to him and says, you like Sally, go hit her and pull her hair. And so our child does so and he's in romantic heaven for six-year-olds, whatever that is. He grows up. He is 17. He knows all about the reproductive system. He knows about biology. And he has developed an object of affection. He thinks about this person a lot and decides to express how he feels. And so when he sees this person during passing time, he walks up and he hits her. Is that romantic heaven? No, that's called assault. What did he do wrong? Well, you know, in one way you wanna say he did absolutely nothing wrong because what happened is we forgot to update our instruction. We forgot to say when you are 17 or 18 and you have an object of affection, here's the information that is important for you to know. Now, how important is that compared to the commutative property in addition. The hidden curriculum also differs based upon who you are with. The way that you act when you go out with friends on a Friday evening is significantly different than the way that you act in an IEP meeting. But no one ever taught you hanging out behavior and meeting behavior. And if you are an autistic person who has one way of being in all environments, could it be possible that the behaviors that you exhibit when you're hanging out with friends should not occur in a more formalized setting. Absolutely. There's also a hidden curriculum of culture and we are beginning to recognize those unwritten rules in culture, but we need to do a better job. We also need to consider our environment when we are looking at unwritten rules. So I'm gonna talk in just a minute about what some of the unwritten rules are and how you can teach them. But when you are teaching them, one of the things that you want to think about is the environment. If you are teaching a skill, it needs to match the environment that the individual is going to be in. Here is an example of someone who made a mistake and because of the context, there might be a little bit of problem. I don't want any trouble. I don't want any trouble either. You know you forgot to take your mask off, right? Okay. With the mask, the situation in changed entirely. So when we are thinking about teaching skills, think about the environment. Now, there's a hidden curriculum in every environment, as I said earlier. There's a hidden curriculum in the school. Generally, classrooms will have rules which are taught, and our students learn those rules, and they do well. But where they have problems is expectations, because we do not teach expectations. 
And in fact, if you will think, how many rules do I have versus what are my expectations? You'll find that you have four or five rules, but your expectations may be numbering up into 20 or more. And these are the things that you do not teach, but you expect students to know. And this is where our autistic students have challenges. There's a hidden curriculum of cursing. Let's take middle school, for example. What is that hidden curriculum? Well, the actual hidden curriculum is, if you are a student, look around first, and if you see an adult, don't do it. Now, we should not be, as adults, teaching our students this, but that's the actual unwritten rule. Now, what happens with our students? Well, our student sees a bunch of guys and he wants to hang out with these guys. So he's looking at them, hanging out, having what appears to be a good time and they're using some very colorful words. And so our young man decides, okay, I can do that too. And so at a later time, he approaches the guys with his own colorful words and he doesn't take note or even realize that it's important that the principal is standing near them. Now, what happens is, is our young person gets in trouble. And what does he think? He thinks, I'm doing the same thing the other guys were doing. Why aren't they getting in trouble? It's not fair, I'm being targeted. It's because he didn't know that unwritten rule. Now, as I said, adults should not teach that particular rule, but is it important that someone teach our kids that particular set of information? There's a hidden curriculum in the community. Which restaurants do you seat yourself at? Which restaurants do you have to wait to be seated? seated? Um, there is a horrible challenge uh, with stocking and uh, individuals who have autism. Well, part of the issue is what is the difference between getting to know someone and stalking them? To me, it can be kind of like along a spectrum. I mean, how many times can you text someone before it becomes too much? Do we teach those sort of things? We also know there's a hidden curriculum on the job. I'll be talking more of that about that next week, but I know someone who lost a job because he said to his boss, when his boss had an idea that this is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. And there's a hidden curriculum in the legal system. You may have seen on 60 Minutes several years ago, a man being questioned by a detective and the detective told him if he just confessed, he could go home. The man confessed, he didn't do the crime, he wanted to go home. And so we need to make sure that we are teaching unwritten rules for every environment. Here are some examples of unwritten rules. If one small incident occurs and the teacher corrects you, it doesn't mean the entire day is bad. Now, for many of our students, the first time that redirection or correction appears, the student has a bad day for the rest of the day because he or she has not been directly taught that there's a way to handle that, okay? You're like, okay, I'll try to do better. You put it to the back of your mind and you do your next task. You should talk to teachers in a pleasant tone of voice because they'll respond to you in a more positive manner. They also like it if you smile every once in a while. Now, this is a life skill. If you are in Walmart and you cannot find something and an employee walks down the aisle, if you turn to them and you smile, you are likely to get help. If you don't, if you orient with a negative face, you may not get help. If you wanna raise, you approach your boss with a smile. The goal of social skills is generally to make others feel good about themselves. It is not uh, designed to make you feel good. 
We need to teach um, our kids that the idea of social skills is that, you know, you say something to someone else that they want to talk about, and then they will talk about what you like to talk about. And then you'll find an intersection of the two. But the idea of social skills is to make someone else feel good so they'll want to talk to you. When your teacher gives you a warning about behavior and you continue that behavior, you're probably gonna get in trouble. If you stop the behavior immediately after the first warning, you probably won't get in trouble. Now, a teacher gives a warning, the student stops the behavior, the teacher forgets about that or puts it to the back of his mind. Well, what happens with our autistic student is they don't know this and they've gotten the warning and they worry about it for the rest of the day. So they need to be, it needs to be explained to them that if they change that behavior, it is no longer an issue. Do not tell other students they smell and need to wear deodorant, which falls under the category of just because it's so doesn't mean you should share it. When a teacher tells another student to stop talking, it's not a good idea to start talking to your neighbor since the teacher has already expressed disapproval of that action. Now, this is a tricky one. The teacher says, Molly, stop talking. Now, what does the teacher really mean? The teacher really means everyone stop talking. But our child who is not named Molly may continue talking or start talking. And then he gets in trouble. And what does he think? He thinks, my name's not Molly. I was not told to stop talking. This is not fair. Can you see how it easy it is to misunderstand these things? When hearing someone speak using incorrect grammar, do not correct them every time, especially in a critical way. If you do something funny, it's usually only funny once. So if you wanna tell a joke 500 times, find 500 people. Don't tell the principal that if she listened better, more kids would like her. And when someone else is getting in trouble, it is not the time to show the teacher something, okay? This is another life skill. If you want the attention of someone else, you're going to want to make sure that they're available to give you that attention in a positive way. If, if an adult is redirecting someone, that adult is probably not going to be uh, available to be ready to be social with someone else. So we need to teach our kids to ascertain mood before approaching. And after ascertaining, they can engage in the social interaction. When you're with classmates or coworkers you don't know very well and you're the center of attention, do not pick your nose, pass gas, or scratch an itch of a private body part. Okay, these are all things that we all do they are, it's stigmatizing, uh, especially at different ages and our kids need to be taught when and how they can do these things. Judy Endo shared with me the hidden curriculum of passing gas. So I thought I would share that quickly. You pass gas when you're four, because it's funny. When you're 15, you pass gas to gross out your parents. When you're 40, you pass gas and walk away quickly. When you're 60, you pass gas and blame the cat. And when you're 80, you pass gas and don't know it. I'm sure you recognize this royal family and I've sadly we lost uh, Prince Philip, but he is the highlight here. Um, watch his face. I said, everyone passes gas, but maybe truly everyone passes gas. It's almost always better not to give unsolicited information on how someone could improve their look or work performance. I received a, an email with a diet from a, an autistic friend of mine, which was so lovely and would have been even better if I had mentioned that I was wanting to lose weight. When you're out in public, the appropriate place to adjust your undergarments is in the bathroom stall. Do not pull on or fix your underwear unless you're in a private place. Do not adjust your private parts in public, and that is unless you're in sports. 
When a teacher wants to know if there are any questions, she doesn't mean any question. She wants to be asked about the thing that she is teaching. So if she's teaching you about Mexico, don't ask if Bubbles is a good name for a hamster. Now, we also need to teach something else. And that is the white lie. We are a nation of liars. And there is an appropriate time to lie, an appropriate time to tell the truth. And this is a difficult thing to teach, but it is an essential skill to teach. And one of our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln, had trouble with this skill. This is just big, my dad says I'm big. Perhaps. So we have to make sure that our students, that our, uh, our autistic folks understand when the truth may not be the very best thing in a situation. Um, I can give you an example from my life. Uh, a friend was visiting me and um, I had a meeting to go to and I do this thing, which I probably shouldn't. But I walked out with out to her in the living room and I said, does this make me look fat? And she said, you don't look any more fat today than you did yesterday. And so we talked about hidden curriculum, unwritten rules. And I left her with a hidden curriculum rule that if someone asked you a question about being fat, you probably don't want to use the word fat in the answer. It is a good general rule not to do in real life what people do in television or the movies, even if the show is called reality. If you look at the Jackass movies and there's a new one coming out, many of, of our students and also neurotypical students have gotten injured trying to do some of those ridiculous shticks in that they see in movies. When a sign says toilet out of order, please use floor below. It means to use a restroom located on the next floor or story down. True story. Now, I've shared with you some examples of, of the hidden curriculum. And the hidden curriculum is an instructional issue. Neurologically, autistic people often have difficulty learning information that neurotypical pe people pick up by themselves, unwritten rules. And because they have this neurotypical or this neurological, neurologically based challenge, we need to teach the hidden curriculum. We need to unhide it for our autistic students. One of the ways that I like to teach the hidden curriculum is the one a day method. Now, this can be used at home or at school, but you start the day with a hidden curriculum item. For example, you um, may take some items that you found off of the internet. You may take the items that are found at the back of the maroon hidden curriculum book. You may take some of the items that are embedded in the yellow hidden curriculum book, and you may start the day by writing an item on the whiteboard or if you're at home talking about it at the breakfast table and you spend three to five minutes in the morning talking about this one hidden curriculum item. Now you you are merely introducing it to the students. You may have to cover it again, but you are developing awareness. I know several principals who will start the morning uh, with announcements, and they include a hidden curriculum item for the entire school. And in that way, each educational professional can follow up with that hidden curriculum item. Now, with the one a day method, you'll notice that I have written here evidence based practice and I've listed listed several evidence based practices. So if you decide to use the one a day method to teach hidden curriculum, you will be 
using an evidence-based practice. The next thing is the teachable moment. You may be with an autistic student and notice that there's a hidden curriculum rule that they don't know. And you can gently whisper in the ear of the individual, pass them a note, um, say the hidden curriculum item out loud. You know, I found out that to enlighten the individual. So when you notice that the individual is having a challenge and it appears related to some information, make the assumption that they don't know the information, that they're not making the mistake on purpose, because chances are they are not. I'd like to share with you some strategies that will allow you to use the teachable moment. And I wanna use some video clips. Social narratives are also ways to teach unwritten rules. For example, here is a social narrative about a visit with Santa Claus. And what has happened is all the things that people generally just figure out about Santa Claus are written here so that when the child with autism visits Santa, he knows exactly what to expect. Also, cartooning can be used to explain unwritten rules. Carol Gray talks about comic strip conversations, speech language pathologists talk about cartooning, and all that it is, is drawing a situation to help a student understand. Now, you can draw it or it can be a commercial um, item such as this. If we have indoor recess today, you guys wanna play Uno? Guys, okay, the unwritten rule here is guys don't talk to guys at the urinal. You can also use video. Oh my gosh, um, our kids who are uh, many times visual learners can learn unwritten rules by watching a video. And there are so many great well, videos on YouTube. There are other uh, video websites. There are, I mean, and you can make videos yourself in no time flat or even have your autistic students make the videos for you. But research shows that our students learn from video and there is that advantage because what they're observing is moving so they can actually see the action taking place. Here is an example of a video that I have used to introduce shaking hands. Hey, man. What's up, Carlos? I want to introduce you to Brian. He's going to be one of our leaders at Ignite. What's up, Brian? Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Half the population suffers from awkward handshake disorder. Most cases go unnoticed. Please donate now because they deserve a second chance. It's gonna be okay. Um, I show this video because I interviewed uh, someone um, in the recent past um, and lovely, uh, we had a lovely chat. And at the end, she tried to fist bump me. Um, she didn't realize that at least from my generation, um, when you are meeting someone for a business purpose, that that is not the appropriate physical 
contact. Well, and post-COVID, who knows what the appropriate physical contact is. The Trusted Friends. Judy Endo, who wrote the book, um, The Odyssey of One Autistic Adult says, make a deal with a trusted friend who understands the hidden curriculum to go somewhere in the community together, such as to the mall or out to eat. And during the time together, do not inhibit anything. The purpose is to allow all your thoughts to be spoken so that your friend can help you decipher the unknown to you hidden curriculum. I'll be talking about um, the importance of having a mentor next week and some of the criteria for a good mentor. But, you know, if you have ever been in a situation and you didn't know what to do, whether or not you have autism, if you have someone with you that who is a trusted friend, and even if they don't know what the answer is, you know, just by being there together, you feel a little bit better. So if our autistic people can have that trusted friend, that mentor who is with them that helps you know, us all do better along that journey called life. Now, some hidden curriculum items, you know, we try to teach beforehand as in the one a day method. And then other hidden curriculum items, you know, we teach as the situation occurs as in um, the Sherlock Holmes example. Well, sometimes the hidden curriculum items will only come to us after the individual has made a hidden curriculum error. And so it is perfectly okay to teach hidden curriculum items after an event has occurred. I wanna give you an example. Um, I have a friend who, um, had as a client, a little boy. And this little boy um, at this time was six years old and he had a special interest in penguins. And his parents really supported that special interest. And so, you know, he had a little penguin backpack, a penguin lunchbox, penguin hat. He even had a pair of penguin shoes, of course, penguin shirts, you know, the whole nine yards. Well, and then as often as they would could, could, they would go to the local aquarium because of course there were penguins. Well, um, one afternoon, he and his mother were at the aquarium. They were there holding hands. And um, within a matter of a second, they were separated. And she quickly looked for him, and, but she couldn't find him. And she instantly, of course, as any parent would do, um, became very upset. Um, her six-year-old was verbal, but when he gets upset, he uh, sometimes, you know, isn't able to talk as well as he normally can. And so she was worried that he wouldn't even be able to say what his name was or her name. And so she went to the folks at the aquarium and they um, had a procedure in place, thank goodness. And they actually shut down the aquarium and they didn't let anybody out or anybody in while they did a search for this sweet little boy. They searched for almost two hours. And you can imagine how frantic the mom had to be. And um, finally found this little boy inside the penguin area, you know, covered with dirt, you know, just as cute as could be his little hat and backpack and etc. And so he was escorted out of that area. And when he uh, and his mother left, um, one of the employees unfortunately said something like, well, we don't want to see you for a long time. Well, mom was, as all parents are, you know, furious and also so happy. <laughs> and she decided that on the way home was not the time to talk about, you know, staying together in a crowded place. And so she was pretty quiet on the way home. And her son, who, of course, had had the time of his life, chattered all the way home about penguins. Well, when they got home, she sent him upstairs to take a bath. And he was able to do that by himself. So he's upstairs, she can hear him drawing the water and, you know, everything seems to be okay. And then she hears some kind of weird noises going in the bathroom, going on in the bathroom. And so she's wondering what the heck is going on. So she walks up there, walks in the bathroom, and there in the bathtub is a penguin. Somehow this little guy had gotten a penguin in his backpack and the silly little penguin stayed quiet all the way home. And so this cute little boy put the penguin in the bathtub so he'd be happy. And of course, the mom had to call the aquarium and say, I know you didn't want to see us, but I think we have something you might want. 
to bring back to the aquarium. He needed to learn the unwritten rule that animals in an aquarium or zoo stay in the aquarium or zoo. They cannot be brought home, even though you would like to very much. There is a hidden curriculum in every environment that we are in. And so it is important that we unhide this curriculum for autistic people. I mentioned restaurants. Which ones do you help yourself? Which ones do you seat? Which ones do you clean up for, by yourself? Which one does someone clean up for you? Um, swimming pools or even lakes. Can you go to the bathroom in one? Which number one or number two? Um, unwritten rules change, as you know, in the airplane and airport. What are you supposed to do? All of these things can be very confusing. And so we need to teach the hidden curriculum. I'd like to cover one area before I end, and that is the hidden curriculum of the bathroom, shower, and locker room. for women is a social event. We go even if we don't have to go, and especially if there is a group going. And when we are in the bathroom, we talk to each other. We talk to each other even if we don't know each other. For example, you could be at a conference and be in a hotel, a hotel bathroom, and somebody can walk in and say, hey, did you go to that session? What did you think? And the other woman will answer that woman even if they don't know each other. Now, for men, bathroom is not a social event. They would never go if they didn't have to go and they will never go in groups. Now, there's differences that are further in the toileting habits in men and women. And one of them has to do with the structure of the bathroom because men's rooms have these things that are lining the wall. They're stainless steel, they can be porcelain. Women generally find them distasteful. They are called urinals. Now in England, they are called urinals. I like that term because it just sounds a little bit grosser and reflects, I think, what they represent. But they're very important because they have rules associated. Okay, for example, if there are five urinals with one being the door and five furthest away from the door, where does the first, first person go? Well, the first person goes to five. The next person who comes in can go to three or one, but sometimes not one because one um, is near the door and a lot of guys don't not like the door. I don't know why. But Think about this. We spend a lifetime teaching our kids to line up. They line up for recess. They line up for lunch. They line up at the bank. They line up at the grocery store. And if they spend too much time in line, apart from each other, what do we say? We say, scooch up. We never think about the urinals. So our young man is at the movie theater. He is too old to go in the, in the men's room or in the ladies room with his mom, so he goes into the men's room. There's a man at urinal five, and because he hasn't been taught to the rules, he goes to urinal four. He's already violated one rule. Man in urinal five is uncomfortable. The next thing, I mentioned men don't talk in the bathroom, but we spend our lifetime teaching our guys with autism to be social acknowledge someone's existence. And so when our young man is at urinal four, he turns to the man in urinal five and no matter what he says, it's going to be inappropriate. He says, how's it going? Man at urinal five, a nice guy, feels uncomfortable and it's out of there in a minute. The man in urinal number five is a sexual offender he knows that our young man is vulnerable. Next thing. 
We as women largely are responsible for teaching toileting behaviors and we teach using a traditional toilet. And when we're teaching boys, well, and girls, we teach pants down to your ankles, underwear down to your ankles, because we want to avoid the mess. And to be frank, we never really avoid the mess. But we don't ever think about the urinals. Our young man at the movie theater, he's standing next to the man in urinal five, bad. He's greeted the man, that's bad. And when he goes to use the urinal, he uses it like he would a public toilet. He pulls his pants down to his ankles and his underwear down to his ankles. Nice man in urinal five, out of there quickly. Sexual offender in urinal five has received an invitation. How important is it to teach the urinal rules? They are part of the hidden curriculum. It's cute here, but as our autistic individuals get older, it could be a challenge. The hidden curriculum is in every environment. It encompasses everything that neurotypical, neurotypical people know without being taught. And the nice thing is, the items have been identified and we can teach them. And we can teach them in three to five minutes a day. We can start our day out with the hidden curriculum. We can teach it on an as needed basis, or we can teach it even after an error occurs. The hidden curriculum, by investing just a small amount of time, can significantly change the life out course of an individual with autism, helping him to better understand his world. I hope that this brief webinar on the hidden curriculum has given you some ideas on um, some hidden curriculum items to teach and some ways to teach them. And I truly hope that you will consider teaching this very important piece of information.